Friday noon, um, and welcome to New America. I'm Kevin Banks, and I'm director of the Open Technology Institute, uh, which is New America's internet policy and technology program, focused on all uh, ensuring that all communities have equitable access to an internet that is both open and secure. OTI is also the institutional home of the independent and independently funded Ranking Digital Rights Project, which today is celebrating the DC launch of its 2018 Corporate Accountability Index. That index measures how well, or more often, how poorly 22 tech companies around the world are protecting the privacy, security, and free expression rights of their users using a set of 35 objective indicators refined over years of research and multi-stakeholder consultation. How many years? Well, um, let me tell you a short story about the development of the index over the years and about the impact of just one of the indicators used in the index to evaluate the companies. Um, I fondly remember uh, coming to the first major private meeting of experts that uh, RDR's founder and director, Rebecca McKinnon, convened at New America to get feedback on her ambitious goal of such an index. That was in the fall of 2012, um, before I even worked here. Um, from there, it was three long years of hard work building, refining, and applying the first version of the index's indicators, leading to the publication of the first rankings in 2015. And in that first corporate accountability index, there was one indicator, just one, that every single company got a zero on. This was the indicator asking whether the company regularly published data about how much content it took down because of violation of its terms of service. At that time, although many companies published such data about government demands for information, about government demands for takedowns, and about copyright-based civil demands for takedowns, no one reported anything about the content that they were taking down voluntarily based on their own content guidelines, even though that was clearly the largest category of takedowns and therefore the category most impactful on users' free expression rights. No one was doing it. But in 2015, RDR put a stake in the ground and made clear that based on the growing consensus of the broad multi-stakeholder range of experts that they were consulting in creating their indicators, the companies that weren't issuing such reports meaning all of them, were not doing enough to provide transparency and accountability to their users. Just as importantly, RDR made clear that those companies that did issue such reports would be given public credit for doing so. RDR made transparency reporting around content moderation a priority when it wasn't one before, and kept pounding on it year after year and index after index. Flash forward to today, three years and two indexes later, and just this week, on Monday afternoon, Google, via YouTube, became the first company to issue a detailed transparency report about its terms of service-based takedowns, uh, highlighting how over 8 million YouTube videos were taken down in Q4 of 2017, along with giving details about how many of those were flagged by humans versus automated systems, how many violated which content pro prohibitions, uh, and more. And, and on Tuesday, Facebook finally published its detailed internal guidelines about how it makes decisions about its own takedowns uh, while expanding its appeals process for impacted users, uh, both steps that are also responsive to RDR's free expression indicators. Um, and now, now that those first dominoes uh, have finally fallen, we're likely to see, cross your fingers, uh, a revolution around content moderation transparency across the industry over the next few years. Uh, just like how the first trailblazing steps on transparency reporting around government demands set the stage for an explosion uh, of reporting across the industry once the Snowden surveillance scandal added gasoline to that fire. As that example shows, the progress from the first demand for a new rights protecting practice to getting one company to actually do it then to get a few more companies doing it as a best practice, and then finally for all companies to be expected to do it as a standard practice. That process of driving adoption can take nearly a decade of grinding work and hyper-focus, the drip, drip, drip over time of water on stone. And that's the work that Rebecca and her amazing team have been doing now for over half a decade and hopefully we'll be doing for many more years, pushing that rock up the hill, not just on that one indicator, but on 34 more and counting. 34 more angles to push companies to do better by their users, 
34 more ways that RER is making progress happen slowly, methodically, drip by drip, one year at a time. It may not be flashy, but that is what real change looks like. That is why I think pound for pound, RDR may be the most impactful project in the internet rights space. And that is why I'm endlessly proud that RDR calls OTI its home. So with that, I would like to congratulate Rebecca and her team on issuing their third Corporate Accountability Index and would like to invite her up to tell you all about their findings, after which she'll be joined by an excellent panel of experts. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kevin, for that really fabulous introduction. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to do sort of a, a credit roll sort of like after the movie um, so that you can really appreciate all the people who, who put uh, work into this once, once you've heard a bit more about the index, uh, if, if uh, Kevin's introduction wasn't enough. Um, so We've been doing this, as Kevin mentioned, for three iterations, but, but a lot more time in developing the index. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, the reason why we're doing this. Of course, uh, if, if you live in Washington or follow, really follow the news at all, you're aware that there's a bit of a clash of power between uh, internet giants and governments these days uh, in, in terms of who wields power to shape people's digital lives and how that relates to their physical lives. So this map shows the world's most popular social networks by country. It's created by an Italian digital marketing entrepreneur who's been doing this for a decade. And it's very interesting. When he started, there were a lot more colors on the map. But all, all of this blue are all the countries where Facebook is the most popular social networking platform. And you see China uh, with uh, uh, QZone and Russia with uh, I'm sorry with Gontaktia, uh and then you know a few other anomalies on the map, but mainly Facebook is one of the sovereigns of cyberspace. We would say for much of the world. Um, if you look at Alexa rankings, and Alexa is is the the company that ranks the most you know the traffic going to websites around the world. If you look at the Alexa ranking for, for the top website in every country around the world, this light blue is Google search. Uh, the pink is YouTube. Uh, so again, Google, the sovereign of cyberspace for, for much of the world. And then you have China and Russia and a few other uh, small exceptions in, in a few other places. Which brings us to ranking digital rights in the map that we show of the companies that we cover. Now, we've selected, we would like to rank more than 22, but resources enable us to rank 22. But we've, we've selected 22 of the most powerful internet, mobile, and telecommunications companies in the world. When you add them up, they're shaping the digital lives of most of the world's internet users around the world. So not just North Americans and, and, and Western Europeans, but, but really when you add up these companies, you've got you know, the sovereigns of cyberspace, you've got the top two mobile device uh, uh, sellers whose operating systems, both through uh, Google Android via Samsung and Apple, are shaping the digital lives of how people are then accessing other platforms. Uh, and you've got a selection of 10 telecommunications companies that are, because of their global footprints operating across the world, are affecting the digital lives and the ability to access internet platforms of most of the people on the planet. So that's, that's how we selected this group. And you've all got a, a four-pager on your seats that has the list, so you don't need to squint and memorize the list of, of companies here. Um, but that's, that's the selection, which is why we have two Chinese companies in, in the index, as you saw from the other maps. It's, it's vital that we include Chinese companies in this equation. Also vital that we include uh, two of the most powerful Russian platforms. Uh, in addition to Samsung, the Korean uh, mobile device maker, we also have Kakao, which is a major messaging and internet platform in South Korea, 
we thought it was very important to include at least one company that is an internet platform that is based uh, in a democracy with strong rule of law that is not in the West, because that helps us kind of test out some of the assumptions about what is universal and what is not. So that's the set of companies that we're looking at. And these are really the choke points for our expression around the world. They know they're able to shape what we know and what we can say online, who we're talking to, in what context, and who knows what about us and what they can do with that information. So this is this year's ranking. This is when you take all the 35 questions we ask, and we're asking questions where we're looking at companies' commitments and disclosed policies that affect users' privacy and freedom of expression. When you add up the scores for all the 35 questions, this is how they stack up. Now you'll see we've, we've got two Ds and everybody else gets an F effectively. So in, in that sense, while obviously there are some that are disclosing more than others, nobody is disclosing enough. And again, the, the list of companies is on your four pager. This is a more detailed breakdown. We, we separate our methodology into three different categories. The first category is governance. So what we're looking at is does the company make a corporate-wide commitment to respect users' freedom of expression and privacy? Is their board and executive and management oversight over the way in which the company is affecting users' freedom of expression and privacy? Are there impact assessments carried out by the company that are comprehensive that track and anticipate what are the positive and negative impacts that the business operations of this company are going to have? on freedom of expression and privacy of users? Is there stakeholder engagement? Uh, is there grievance and remedy uh, when, when people's rights are harmed? We're looking at all those types of questions. Freedom of expression. A company does not get high marks for freedom of expression because it's the biggest free-for-all, right? That's not what we mean. We mean freedom in the context of human rights. That's very important. Uh, so it's not that the, the company with the fewest rules wins. Um, if there's no rules, if there's no governance, without governance, life is nasty, brutish, and short for everyone who isn't really large and really wealthy uh, and likely male. Uh, that's why we have governance, um, and, and it's important. Um, the, the issue is, is the governance accountable? And is it actually serving the rights and interests of the governed? Right, that's, that's what speech governance should be about. And so we're looking for transparency by companies about all the different factors that are shaping what you can say online and what you can access online and how you communicate online. We want to see transparency about the types of government demands they're receiving and how they're responding to those. Demands from other parties, whether it's copyright holders or uh, people are flagging against harassment, we want to see how those mechanisms are working and the volume and nature of content that's being restricted or accounts restricted and so on. We also want transparency around things like network shutdowns by telecommunications companies, how networks are being managed and manipulated, et cetera. Privacy is in three buckets. First, you have the, what, what in, uh, the, in Europe is known as uh, data, pro data protection issues, um, and in the States it tends to be called consumer privacy issues, but the whole question of what is the life cycle of user data? What's being collected? What's being done with it? With whom is it being shared? Under what circumstances? How much control does the user have over the use and sharing of that data? Uh, how long is it retained? Um, are you being tracked around the web, et cetera? Uh, we want to see clear transparency about that, and I'll show you some of the results on, on that question later. The second bucket relates to government demands for user data. Is the company being maximally transparent about the demands it receives for surveillance and, and for sharing user data with authorities. Uh, and the third bucket are security questions. So is the, is the uh, company providing credible evidence that it is taking strong measures to secure users' data from theft and breach and so on? So that's, that's the index. And you'll see 
that the, the companies that score the total high score don't necessarily get the high score on the categories. And as you drill down to each indicator, it starts to vary even more, as, as you'll see. So this year, our methodology, our questions were the same as last year. So we were able to track improvement and change. Interestingly, Apple was the most improved. Um, Apple does a lot of things to protect users' privacy, but for whatever reason has not really disclosed a lot of them to their users themselves. They've disclosed these things to security experts, but not actually on their official materials to users. Uh, so just really by making more disclosures directly to users, they managed to boost their score a great deal. Their score on freedom of expression uh, was less improved. Uh, the company does not really make a clear commitment to freedom of expression um, and has a lot less transparency around content removal in the App Store and, and that kind of thing. Um, a couple other interesting things to note about the changes, and on our website, there's actually a page that, that kind of documents everything that changed for every company. And we also have individual company report cards that talk about kind of what, what was improved and what didn't. A um, couple interesting things in the internet platforms, both Chinese companies in the, in, in the index improved. They didn't improve on anything that relates to government demands. I think if you know anything about China, that, you know, the reasons for that don't need to be explained. However, they did make improvements on security, on consumer data privacy issues, so in, in terms of being more transparent about what's being collected and shared for commercial purposes. Uh, and some, some improvements in transparency around terms of service enforcement as well. So, so it's interesting to see that even in very difficult places, uh, as, as far as regulation and law is concerned, some companies are, are trying to prove that they're doing what they can for their users. The, on the telecommunications side, the main improvements came from the three European telecommunications companies that are members of, that recently joined the Global Network Initiative. Um, which we'll talk about more in the panel. Um, and that's also reflected most in the governance scores. So in the governance category, the companies that got by far the highest scores for having much more systematic commitments and accountability mechanisms and risk assessment throughout the company were all Global Network Initiative members. Not that it's perfect, there's much stronger risk assessment and accountability when it relates to government demands than as relates to other things, like commercial privacy or terms of service enforcement. Um, and that's, that's where a lot of the deficiencies lay. But we're seeing much stronger governance by GNI companies than anyone else. And most strikingly, on the one question we ask about the comprehensiveness of human rights impact assessment, uh, the companies in the GNI are showing much more evidence of impact assessment than anyone else. So that's interesting. Um, moving on to freedom of expression. Uh, at the telecommunications layer, for people who uh, live outside of the United States, these types of, of pages are, are fairly common. One in India, when somebody tries to access a website that's been blocked. Uh, another one in, uh, uh, in the UK, where, where some content has been restricted because it's perceived to be adult content. This is on a public network. Um, so the question that we look at is how transparent are telecommunications companies about various external demands they're getting to block websites, block access to websites or apps. And the only really three of the telecommunications companies tell us much of anything even about their process for responding to third party requests to, to block content. Uh, and everybody else is not transparent. Uh, and even with just data, transparency reporting about third party requests to block content, even government requests, um, we're seeing very little transparency around the world by telecommunications companies. So uh, globally, that's a real problem. People do not know why content is being restricted and who should be held responsible for that, for that content restriction through their telecommunications providers. Um, another freedom of expression indicator related to network shutdowns. This is an issue that people working on internet freedom internationally spend a lot of time on. 
you have a lot of countries in India in particular, there were 64 instances of the government in various localities just shutting down the you know, internet data, mobile data uh, completely uh, in cities and, and regions. Um, we only have three companies that, that showed you know, much disclosure uh, on their policies for, and processes for handling network shutdowns. The ones that did improve disclosure were all global network initiative companies as well, um, as shutdown requests are entirely a government demand issue. Moving to the internet and uh, mobile ecosystem companies, uh, many people are fam familiar when, when a page on, on Facebook gets blocked or a YouTube video gets blocked. Uh, and in China, that's an example of a cute little block page that you get on Sina Weibo. Uh, but these types of removal and, and blocking notices are, are pretty common across internet and mobile platforms. Um, and we're starting to see, you know, as, as Kevin mentioned, transparency reporting, particularly around government demands to block and remove content at the platform level. Transparency reporting um, has been going on for some years to varying extents by some of the major platforms. So that's an example of Twitter's transparency reporting, which has been going on for a number of years. Facebook is starting to report more about content removals, about although they, they, they report a lot less and their score reflects that. Um, Google's been doing transparency reports about government demands and copyright takedowns the longest. On the, on the left is their transparency report um, related to government content removal and blocking demands. And you can see the demands have gone way up in the last couple of years. And, and this is one of the many reasons why um, transparency reporting is important. So you can see where the demands are coming from and what the trends are on the demands, both in terms of who they're coming from, but what kind of content and so on. Um, which, you know, we want to see transparency from governments too, but corporate transparency is a start. Google also gets credit for its transparency around the right to be forgotten demands that it receives in Europe from, from private actors who want, want their, their search results delisted. Um, when it comes to terms of service enforcement, and we, we stopped our research before the announcements earlier this week, obviously, um, but these were the scores around transparency around terms of service enforcement. We had already fairly strong disclosure about what the rules were, and with Facebook's latest disclosures, we'll see that bump up even more, but very little data um, as of January about the volume and nature of content actually being removed on terms of service enforcement. And so with Google's latest transparency report, um, that will go up. And uh, so this is, these are some screenshots from YouTube's um, uh, terms of service enforcement. And as Kevin was saying, they, they have data on you know, what types of people had flagged the content, you know, what, what sparked the takedown, was it automated or by a trusted flagger or you know not by a human or whatever reasons etc so it's very very helpful and then this is Facebook's um, recent disclosure um, the most transparency that we're seeing is coming uh, in the privacy side on government demands for user data that's that's where the most transparency reporting has been happening these are examples and and you're seeing transparency from tele, some of the telecommunications companies on, on that too, even well beyond the Global Network Initiative, but certainly sort of the commitment that GNI companies make to be transparent about government demands has really helped, I think, to, to fuel that. However, when it comes to the, the uh, data protection consumer privacy indicators, this is our bucket of, of uh, what we you know, lately shorthand are sort of the, the, the Facebook issues uh, because these, these, the, these are sort of the questions that have been most in the news lately in terms of how transparent are companies about what's being collected, how it's being used, with whom it's being shared, under what circumstances, how much control does the user have over the sharing of their data, collection and use, et cetera. Um, the highest score is an F and it goes down from there. Um, and that's where Facebook was at the time. I think their latest disclosures might bump them up slightly, but it certainly doesn't bring them to the front. A lot of the disclosures were more just kind of rewording of 
current practices and making them more clear. There were some substantive things, so it's not that not that they, their score won't change at all, uh, but uh, there's there's still a lot uh, that's that needs to be done there. But this line here is is just to point out that the telecommunications companies are all as bad as Facebook, if not worse. Uh, and that's that's one conversation we have not been having so much of and maybe need to have a bit more of. Um, on one, and just to, just to show how when you drill down to the specific indicators, the, the ranking changes dramatically from what you see from the overall score. When we ask how transparent is the company about what user information they share and with whom, Kakao, the Korean company, is way more transparent than everybody else. And this has something to do with the fact that privacy law in, in South Korea is pretty strong. Google doesn't do so well, despite you know its overall score in the index is highest because Google happens to just disclose more things about more things than everybody else, right? But when you, when you drill down into specific practice, particularly because specific practice that relate most closely to the business model, you, you, see, you see other things happening. Uh, and Apple could be a lot more transparent than it is, and I'm not quite sure why. Um, this is what we like to call the Cambridge Analytica indicator. <laughs> um, how transparent are internet and mobile ecosystems companies about the options that users have to control their own information? Um, and this includes a sub-question. If you go on the website and look at the, the, the sub-questions in here, it, it, has, it has to do with how much control do people have over the sharing of their information for targeted advertising, and you only get full credit if it's opt-in rather than opt-out. Um, Facebook got the lowest score in the entire index behind two Chinese and two Russian companies. Um, their latest changes may move them slightly up, but uh, my hypothesis is that unless further changes are made between now and our next research round, they will not be at the front. Let's just put it that way. Um, Apple is the only company that commits not to track you across the internet. Nobody else commits that, and they do it, and the level of transparency about it is problematic. Um, security, amongst our various security questions, and there, there are several, and we don't have time to get into all of them, but you can go on the website. There's a whole chapter in the report about our security questions. The question that, that looks at does the, the company disclose what its policies are for handling data breaches, only Apple in the internet and mobile ecosystem companies discloses anything. Um, and uh, among the telcos, there's, there's very little disclosure. But Vodafone shows that you don't blow up and disintegrate and die if you, if you disclose your policies. Um, so, so that's uh, some interesting food for thought. How transparent are companies about their security oversight processes? So things like, are you conducting a third party audit? Um, and uh, can you at least, you know, we're not looking for information that's going to aid the advers adversary in attacking your platform, but just some basic evidence that you have processes. Um, Kakao and Google are getting full points. Uh, everybody else is disclosing a lot less than we think uh, is, is necessary to reassure users of what it is you're doing. Uh, and and in, in the telco sector, also some problematic things. So. One could go on all day if one really wanted to go through every single indicator, but, but I, we want to get to the discussion because that's more lively and, and um, uh, we can get into a lot of other questions. But we have a lot of recommendations for companies in our report on our website. Um, in the individual company report cards, we have recommendations for each company, which focus on even if there's no legal change in your home jurisdiction, here are all the things you could do today to improve your score. Um, and uh, we also, in each chapter, have much more detailed recommendations around the specific types of, of subjects. But it really boils down to we, much, we need much more um, thorough governance around these issues. We need to see very clear board level commitment and oversight. We need to see risk assessment that's comprehensive. We need to see grievance and remedy that is meaningful. Um, and we need to see clear stakeholder engagement and a real effort to innovate 
around both business model, technologies, and design that are actually compatible with enabling people to basically function in an information ecosystem that is compatible with the kind of society we want to have. Um, and, and companies really need to be thinking about that, and that is compatible with human rights, with the exercise of human rights uh, by users. Um, we have a lot of recommendations for governments in the report. Uh, this is just kind of a few, but uh, we, we found that there are a lot of companies that would get higher scores if the law in their home country was not so bad. Um, so there, there are many, many jurisdictions that are making their uh, their, their companies um, uncompetitive on these issues. I mean, China is a very obvious um, example, but there are a lot of countries that have laws that don't allow companies to even disclose, you know, transparency reports on copyright takedowns. And what, what, the, what the public interest reason for that is, is beyond me. Um, or, you know, other, other, you know there's, there's all kinds of transparency around content and network shutdowns and so on that companies are not doing because the law prevents them. Uh, there's also you know, the lack of data privacy law around the world is clearly a big problem. One example is MTN in South Africa, whose disclosure about its handling of user data is very poor, not because there's any political reason why they can't do it, but the law's not forcing them to, so they're not bothering. Um, and we see this in a lot of countries. So, so either stakeholders need to impose consequences or the law needs to impose consequences or some combination of, of the two. Um, so just kind of a little advertising for the website put together by my colleagues, um, which is just really fabulous this year. You can really explore the data in a very granular way. Um, you can go through each indicator and, and click on it and see kind of how each company scored on each question. And you can even go in, let's say you click on Facebook here for this particular indicator, and you can see what score they got for each sub-question for each service and so on. You can also go and download the raw data and, and get all the researcher comments for every single score. So if you really want to geek out on our data, and you know if you really think that Google didn't deserve the scores it got, um, you can go into our spreadsheet and look at the researcher comments for why every single sub-indicator got the score it did. Um, so, so, you know, you, you know that's, that's kind of what you need to do with this kind of thing, because otherwise people are like, why did you give them this? And we can explain it, and they can look at it if they, if they want to. So where are we going next? Um, there's a lot of questions we didn't ask, obviously. Um, and as the world continues to evolve and technology evolves, we're, we're thinking about should we ask a question about transparency in relation to the use of algorithms and also risk assessment in, in terms of the use of algorithms? What question should we, what kind of transparency should we look for in terms of the deployment of AI, artificial intelligence and risk assessment around AI and grievance and remedy around AI? Also, should we be asking more questions that relate to the business models of the companies and the risks uh, and, and transparency that we want to see around that, particularly advertising? So, so those are all questions we're going to be exploring in the coming months uh, before we start research on our next uh, index. And we'll probably make some adjustments to the next methodology in some way, hoping to kind of have broader conversations with more experts and stakeholders kind of through this process that we engage in to kind of test out um, the, the more difficult indicators that have less consensus around them to, to really try and figure out what is the standard we want to set for corporate transparency around these issues. It's not always entirely clear at this point. We also have, um, you know, we're only evaluating 22 companies on a set of questions. There's a lot of other companies and technologies we're not evaluating. Uh, we're not ever going to be able to do it all, but we're partnering with people who want to take our methodology and adapt it and evaluate other things. So we're working with Consumer Reports uh, on a set of standards for evaluating the Internet of Things on privacy and security. Um, and uh, we also, our methodology is public on the website, and so we're starting to see researchers around the world adapt it to local, regional 
companies. So in New York, the New School recently applied our, our methodology to uh, evaluate ISPs in New York City. Um, they didn't do so well. Um, <laughs> you can download their report. Uh, but also an NGO at, 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 in uh, Lebanon has used our methodology to evaluate the privacy policies of telecommunications companies across the Arab world. So um, we're very encouraged by this that, you know, we can't cover the whole world and all the things and all the issues, but, but we're, we're really thrilled that we're starting to help provide a framework that people can use to, to explore the, the companies and the issues that have greatest impact on their communities. Um, and, and so I'm hoping that a broader ecosystem will, will emerge. Finally, um, my credit role. <laughs> um, all of this uh, would not be possible without our team. Um, we have six full-time people, but also work with a lot of researchers around the world who, who, uh, who do uh, who kind of work with us for shorter periods of time with expertise in various languages and specific technologies. But our research team, um, Amy Brulette, who's based in Budapest most of the time, which is why she's not here, but I hope she's on the webcast. Laura Reed, um, our senior research uh, analyst based in New York. Andrea Hackel, research analyst who's normally here, but due to a family emergency is not here today. Um, that research team are, are sort of the core who are working with our researchers around the world to make this happen. Our program manager, Lisa Goodermuth, who is in Berlin some of the time and occasionally visits us here, but hi Lisa if you're on the webcast. Um, policy and communications analyst, Ilana Ullman, who's also now living in Berlin, and, and of course, all sorts of researchers and partners, and they're all on our website. Share Labs, based in Serbia, did our, our, our data visualization website and, and designed the graphics, and they're, they're incredible. Uh, and they, they do a lot of great activism themselves. Um, Allison Yost from OTI, the communications diva. There she is, she's hiding, she's being modest. Um, this beautiful report. There's, there's a couple copies of the full report out there, but also these four pagers and everything, that's, that's due to her incredibly hard work and, and creativity. Um, so, so just admire these things and admire Allison. Um, and, and, uh, and then, you know, uh, last but not least, our funders who make this possible. As, as Kevin alluded to, we do not take corporate funding. We can prove under audit that we have no corporate funding. Um, our, our funders are um, the State Department Bureau of Democracy, Rights, and Labor. Thank you, Laura. Um, they have been supporting us uh, since the previous index, um, and uh, we're grateful for that support uh, and, and very light touch. Um, and uh, Ford Foundation, Open Society Foundation, and the MacArthur Foundation, who were our are kind of foundational funders from the beginning, without whom this would never have gotten off the ground. So we really appreciate their faith in us. And uh, there's also a, a set of advisors, including Leslie here, Bennett back there, some some others out out there in the world, listed on our website as our sort of advisory council, who who've been giving us advice as we've been nav navigating a whole set of different pressures that people try to put on us. <laughs> um, so thanks so much. And with that, I will stop thanking people and thank the panel um, who uh, I hope will come up and introduce everyone. Um, hello, uh, thank you all for staying for the uh, discussion part of this. Um, we were just confirming that we will do audience Q&A um, towards the, the end of this. So if you have questions, I'm sure you do after seeing just a glimmer of the immense amount of data that's in this report, um, please 
hold on to them because we will definitely leave plenty of time for questions. Uh, I should probably introduce myself. My name is Emma Alonzo. I'm the director of the Free Expression Project at the Center for Democracy and Technology, which is a tech policy um, advocacy group based here in Washington, D.C. with offices in Brussels. Uh, I'll be the nominal moderator for this session, but we've got a lot of experts with a lot of great thoughts um, and things to discuss, so I don't imagine having to do a whole lot. Um, let me introduce the other uh, two panelists real quick. Uh, Rebecca, who you know, uh, hopefully, by now. Um, and then we have uh, Shanti Kalathil, uh, the director of the International Forum for Democratic Studies at the National Endowment for Democracy, um, who has also worked at such places as USAID, Wall Street Journal in Asia, and has a lot of um, really interesting perspectives to share, particularly as focused on uh, kind of the situation in China. Um, and then we also uh, have Leslie Harris of Harris Strategy Group, who is a, also a professor at Georgetown University, former president of Center for Democracy and Technology, a founding member of the Global Network Initiative, and the reason I am in this space, <laughs> um, who hired me on as an intern uh, a decade ago. So uh, with that, um, I mean, obviously, as uh, both Kevin and Rebecca um, you know, said in, in their remarks so far, this may be the most focus on kind of the role of technology platforms and um, telecommunications provider in sort of our daily lives, in our societies, in our elections, um, than we've possibly ever had before in the history of the internet. Not just here in the US, but in countries around the world. You know, more and more people, I think, are having to come to grips with the fact that there are gigantic companies out there with playing a huge role in our access to information, our security, our privacy, and what exactly they're doing and, and what we as people, as governed people, can know about it, um, it can be kind of difficult to determine at times. Um, we've seen uh, a number of different kind of events in Congress just over the past month from the um, Cambridge Analytica hearings with Mark Zuckerberg um, a couple of weeks ago to yesterday's uh, House Judiciary Committee hearing on the filtering practices of social media platforms, which is an incredibly important issue to actually be thinking really thoughtfully about um, that uh, also just sort of featured a lot of staffers trying to, to keep straight faces as the, the discussions went kind of off in lots of different directions. Uh, so, you know, a variety of levels of uh, kind of public policy conversation about these issues right now, but one of the things that um, I know a lot of us kind of in the advocacy space keep coming back to is the need for real data, real information about what are pra the practices of these companies and what kinds of consequences and impacts on user rights they actually have. And this is where a report like Ranking Digital Rights is, I mean, it's the, the leader in the field as far as rigorous evaluation according to open methodology, you know, that really enables not just understanding a particular company's practices much better, um, but also comparing across companies um, and across countries and sort of really getting a much more holistic perspective grounded in really solid methodology. So just, Rebecca, thank you <laughs> for thank you. kind of you and your team contributing this to, um, to these public policy discussions that are so important for all of us. Uh, it's, it proves that it can be done. It, we can actually have solid data to work from when we're thinking about these big difficult issues. Um, and I, I can't wait for the fourth report to come out. Um, but so to, to start off the conversation, I, I thought I'd just like to ask each of you to, um, to kind of comment on uh, in this welter of privacy, security, free expression issues, and the, the role of these platforms, what's, what's the one issue that you're most concerned about or, or that you'd just sort of like to raise for the group? And maybe we'll start with Leslie. You just, you just limited me to one, huh? <laughs> um, so here's what worries me about most, and this is in the wake of Facebook putting out its new platform that's gonna allow you to deal with all of your data. Number one, we can't get away from this advertising model. And as long as we have this advertising model, um, we are, you know, we're the product. And so I think it's really, really hard. And, and you know, at least in the US, very soon, because we're losing the net neutrality rules, we're gonna have another whole player who right now no, don't have any privacy rules. Um, so the data collection and the, and the value of data to make these companies grow, uh, in my mind, uh, 
is so powerful that asking, in, you know, and basically, I want to I want to have the ability to like you know take myself out of being a fashionista. That's what Facebook sees me as most. Um, and <laughs> who knew? <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> well, they, there's some, um, some other interesting categories. So I think it's fine to provide these tools as long as we acknowledge um, that in some ways we talk about security theater. I, I think a lot of this is privacy theater. And I'm going to be pretty right on about that. Um, secondly, and I think um, equally important, we're talking about algorithms and algorithmic decision making and profiling. Nothing they're doing isn't an algorithm. So to sort of say when you're being, um, somehow your data is subject to an algorithm, there was, I can't remember whether I just read this, but besides the fact that 65% of the people get their news from Facebook, an equal number had absolutely no idea what an algorithm was or like how they were getting the content they're getting. So. Just, just as if like back in the day when we would say consent is not the answer to privacy, you're putting the entire burden, there has to be, sometime there's either a shift in business models or, you know, or, or all of this is privacy theater. Um, and secondly, there has to be, on the part of companies, uh, some kind of red lines. Um, you know, the, to me, the biggest lesson out of Cambridge Analytica, and you know, looking backwards, they can all go, "Oh, we didn't know what was going on." Yeah, with a close partner who they've done business with for years, is you know, I call this the everything's called advertising. So if you gave some kind of transparency to what was going on, they'd say, "Yes, they're doing political advertising," and people understand advertising is toothpaste, right? So. Um, we, we have to figure out like where is the responsibility, the human rights responsibility, the ethical responsibility of companies as they are being constantly driven by money and an advertising model to draw some red lines. You know, I call Cambridge Analytica the who can we turn into being a Nazi <laughs> algorithm, and Facebook just said, hey, sure, go on the platform and you know the. Those people who are angry, depressed, and can't get a woman, and send this out because our research shows we can make them right wing. And so, in some ways, the, the sort of combination of all our data and the pressure to advert, you know, turn everything into, I'm just advertising. Zuck said that at the hearing. It's just advertising, right? So, I, I just think there, I don't yet know, Rebecca, what it means for the index. I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, but we have to shift some of this focus to, to some kind of substantive red lines. Um, and I don't know if that's ethics. If you look at Facebook when they're doing their own research, their own research, they have the best ethical pro process in the industry. I did a study last year on what they were doing in research. But not when they have people running around the platform, right? right? So I just think that um, we may want to start asking some questions about that, right? Uh, about, uh, you know, and, and I also think we have to think of the difference between algorithms that think I'm a fashionista and algorithms that want to make me a Nazi or that are trying to decide what jobs I should get and start to consider what's a consequential algorithm. And as a company, is there a different level of transparency, a different um, internal responsibility about those kinds of, of algorithms? I mean, if I, I am, according to Facebook, an African-American fashionista with liberal politics. I, I, I'm even, I'll own all three. I just think that maybe <laughs> algorithms are not quite as, <laughs> as good as, as advertised. So, that, those are some of my concerns. Another whole thing about content curation, but I'll we'll come back there. to that. <laughs> <laughs> and Chauncey, from your perspective. So allow me first to take a step back and heap some more praise on ranking digital rights, which I hope will not um, be objected to by anybody. But, but just to give it some context, I think even just a few years ago, as both Rebecca and Kevin alluded to in their remarks, 
the idea of what went into this mess, this great sort of miasma of information that the companies interacted with to then provide these services, it was a black box. There was just no way to get into it. And what RDR and before at GNI to some extent have done is to try to quantify to some extent, look, here's what we understand about the things that are important for human rights and for, as Rebecca so nicely put it, the way to make sure that the way we want to live our lives is matched by the platforms that we're living our lives on. Um, so that's by way of saying that I think we now have tools. And Rebecca handed us the indicators before the stack. Uh, these are not just indicators. They don't just go into the project. They're actually a compilation of all these evolving best practices and standards as we know it. So this in itself is just a valuable component. Um, I think for me, if we get to the question of concern, is what are the next black boxes and what do we not know enough about? What do we need to unpack more in order to understand how to compile the next set of these and to understand what the best practices are? For me, um, over the years, my unit has always been by default to look at the governments, usually authoritarian governments, and what are the practices within their borders. But I've always understood that to be inadequate because, in fact, the global information space is not governed only by national borders. It is an intersection of corporate policies and government policies, and that's where the action takes place. And so um, we need to be able to incorporate these two things more fully. And for me, the worrisome part is where it hits, I think I would probably echo sort of the privacy and surveillance components. In the issues that I look at, and particularly with respect to China, it, it's been a big flip over to incorporating elements of surveillance into everyday life. And in those sorts of environments, within China, there's very little civil society can really do to push back against that. There's not a strong rule of law environment. Um, what do we need to know about this emerging aspect of our lives, which I fear is not going to be constrained to authoritarian environments, but will be sort of more broadly felt outside of them as well. And Rebecca, do you have, I mean, I know, yeah. with well, you know I've already full perspective about, of the indicators. Yeah. Too much, but, but um, you know, it, it's funny, last week before the index came out, I was talking to a, a journalist, you know, in advance um, of, of the, the index coming out to let them know. And this person asked me, is there any company worse than Facebook? Um, and I'm like, yeah, most of them. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I guess the, the point, you know, when you think about the set of companies we looked at, these are the world's biggest publicly listed companies that for, there's lots of imperfections, but they actually do care about what the public thinks of them and they do care and all of them all of them i think i think it's fair to say all of them all of them as with many big companies most big companies have different kind of factions within the company you've got the privacy people you've got the security people you've got the marketing people you've got the pr people you, you know et cetera, et cetera, and the money people um and uh and and people are competing for resources and attention of senior management and I hear from a lot of people in a number of these companies, you know, who are kind of at middle management level, who are like, this index is very useful because I can tell my boss that we didn't do very well on this particular indicator, and we, know we need more resources and kind of management priority to do better on this because this really matters for our company. You know? and, and so there's people that really care. I would say in most of these companies, even in some of the companies that aren't doing so well, we've had some interesting conversations with, with people kind of at the, the middle management level. Um, but there's a whole set of companies out there. I mean, there's the Internet of Things that we're doing some work on already. And, and I got to tell you, if, if we took these criteria and applied them to many sort of Internet of Things companies, it, you know like two and three and single digit kind of thing. Um, yeah, and, and, but it also gets even more complicated because a lot of Internet of Things devices are actually compilations of several different corporate entities working together. You've got an 
operating system or sort of information platform or a payment platform, you know, different companies, and then you've got the hardware and so on, and none of them are clear about their policies and none of them are taking responsibility for much of anything if something goes wrong. Um, so, so it kind of gets worse from here. Really, um, which which is one of, one of the concerns. The other concern is, you know, sometimes people come to me and say, "Well, why aren't you, you know, looking at the the companies that provide networking equipment, or why aren't you looking at the companies that, you know, sell surveillance software to the Egyptian government or something?" Um, and that latter category, they're the arms dealers. They don't care about rankings, right? I mean, because otherwise they wouldn't be arms dealers, right? Um, and, they're, and they're not consumer facing, so they're, they don't care about the user's trust in their product, right? They, they might be interested in the Egyptian government's trust in their project, but that's, that's, that's different. Um, and, and kind of the network equipment layer, I think you probably need a different theory of change to really incentivize that layer of, of company. So, so I, I think, yeah, um, I, I, I kind of like to think of this as proof of concept for a certain set of types of companies that care about their relationship with people. Um, but we need to think more about kind of what's the pain point for different categories of companies and what sort of data we need and to put in the hands of which types of actors to to get change for different types of companies. Um, and just on, on my part, as far as like big concerns, um, picking up on something that, that Shanti had said about the sort of, I guess, habituation of people to surveillance through kind of what gets incorporated in, into these technologies, I'm also concerned about that on the free expression side of things too, and the sort of the environment that we're in where, you know, a, a content host, a social media platform, potentially could try to comprehensively apply its terms of service across every piece of content that is uploaded. Um, so if you have, say, a policy against hate speech, it's technically very difficult. Doing it would probably involve vast amounts of overbroad or under-inclusive kind of censorship of the content, but they have the means to affect any of the posts on their service. And that this is a really different environment from how sort of laws about speech have applied to people in societies before, right? That there's, if we have a law in the US, say, against issuing a, a true threat of violence against a person, there are a lot of things that actually rise to the level of true threat of violence that are never heard by anybody, you know, in government or law enforcement or, you know, turned into a case or turned into a prosecution. There's this sort of, uh, there is a big gap between the number of times the law is actually applied and the, the amount of speech that it could potentially be applied to. And I think the sort of shift from uh, an, an offline environment where the laws, the standards, the rules exist, and they're applied, you know, a probably fairly small percentage to a fairly small percentage of cases that actually merit it versus the potential perfect application of rules about speech online is just a, a societal shift that I think we're still really kind of grappling with and, and working through the consequences. Um, it also raises a lot of questions around should platforms terms of service conform with human rights standards substantively and what all of the different consequences of that are. But we've got a lot to talk about, so we won't <laughs> dig you deep into that right now. Um, I wanted to have, follow up one question in particular, I think for um, Rebecca and Shanti about uh, the Chinese companies in the index, um, Baidu and Tencent. Uh, and Rebecca, you had mentioned how they actually both showed improvement over time and just wondered about your kind of, your thoughts on companies like Baidu and Tencent operating in the Chinese environment. I think there's sometimes a tendency to just sort of say, oh, well, it's China. Right. There's nothing to be done. Um, but here you see companies actually improving right. over the last yeah. year. I mean, they're not, they're not improving their transparency about government censorship demands, and they're not Im improving their transparency about government surveillance that's, you know, like in involves government authorities sitting in their offices looking at users' activities. They're not transparent about that, and that is not improving. But uh, when it comes to disclosing, again, um, what's, what's being shared commercially, um, what's, what's being shared with other entities that are not government, uh, what's being collected, how it's being used, 
we're seeing a willingness to, to be more transparent and some value placed on that, uh, and, and also security. Um, in China, the Chinese public is very concerned about hacking and theft. It's a huge problem in China. And so a company that can demonstrate it's making real efforts to shield their, to protect their users against criminals um, is, is, you know, that's, that's a, a real commercial incentive. So, so th there are definitely, you know, areas. It's, it's, it's again, um, I think in a, in a number of jurisdictions we, we see this, where you, you really, if, if you're going to kind of push the company to improve, you have to do a bit of an analysis about, okay, here are the things we recognize require legal reform, right? And in China, it might not be very possible to see the legal reform anytime soon, but in a place like India, for example, you know, you, you could see civil society and the companies getting together and telling the government, actually, there's no public interest reason why this law is preventing this disclosure and let's get it changed. Um, and that it's in the company's interest to do that. So, but, but yeah, in China, it's, it's very interesting. And the other thing, interesting thing is that one of our audiences is investors. And this is another reason why the Chinese companies care because a lot of major investors are investing in Chinese internet companies. You know, have big holdings in Baidu and Tencent and Alibaba and so on. And so I've heard from investors who have told us that our data is actually quite useful to them for their calls because they're responsible investors who invest in Chinese, Chinese companies. And they, they then kind of have a better, have greater clarity about what they can raise with their Chinese um, holdings where they can actually have a real conversation um, and what is going to be less fruitful. So that's, that's also quite useful. And just, I think briefly, just to build on that, the, um, what we've seen is actually an interesting shift. And it used to be, you know, back in the day when I know Rebecca was looking at this many years ago and looking at these companies, really the focus was just domestically within China. But these companies are now huge. They're some of the biggest internet companies in the world. And they have expansion plans. And they are tying up increasingly both with outside investors, but also buying stakes in other companies themselves. And so they will be part of this global ecosystem. So putting that into that global comparative context is important. And, you know, I w applaud anything that will allow those companies to do something that will help protect user rights even a little bit more within China. That said, I think, you know, part of the challenge here is understanding what a lawful request to take down content means in China. I mean, that can kind of have a lot of scope to it. And so I know for the purposes of the index, it's focused on lawful requests, and that's important because it has to be a standard. But that's why I think there needs to be this overlay of actually understanding that this close interplay both between the private sector and the state within China, and that is actually becoming ever tighter now, um, as well as sort of this weak rule of law environment in which the companies operate. And because of the expansion that I talked about before, it has the potential to have global effects. So this is a great way to bring that into the conversation. Um, and before we open it up to audience questions, uh, w so one sort of theme that came up in your presentation this morning um, was the, the role of the Global Network Initiative, or sort of the, the fact that a number of the countries in the index are members of the, the GNI, and how that seems to really have had an impact on um, the kinds of disclosures that they make. So I was wondering if, Leslie, as one of the co-founders of the Global Network Initiative, could you give us a little bit of background on sort of what the conversation was, one, what it is, two, <laughs> what the conversation was like when it was really first getting started, and, and how that sort of shifted over the about 10 years that it's been so, in existence. I think a lot of people probably know, sorry, I'm losing my voice, um, that, I mean, the process to stand up GNI happened, you know, in an environment of the Chateau arrest in China. Um, a Congress here that was trying to pass laws that some of us thought were unworkable. U it was U.S.-based. We, we actually had European companies in who did not stay in, but the focus was very laser-like on how do you respond to government, to government demands for censorship, to government demands for uh, user information or, and surveillance. 
And I think what was very clear at the time, because we had some European NGOs who wanted it to be broader and look at commercial practices, was that we were going to not get that step one if we tried to expand it. So, so GNI really was, and I think for the most part still is, focused on um, the, the relationship between these companies and what government demands of them. Um, what's happened in these 10 years, um, you know, how many years since you wrote your book? Came out in 2012. Yeah, well, it was kind of prescient, I thought, because a lot of people were saying, you know, sovereigns of cyberspace, that's a bit much. No, um, Rebecca, you're too negative. Yeah, you're so <laughs> negative. <laughs> well, I, I, I remember saying that to, to Evgeny once upon a time, and now I teach his book like it's a Bible. Um, things happened, and the thing that really happened was this extraordinary shift of power, um, a, a technological development that allowed what used to be, we're collecting this piece of data and we're going to use it for this purpose, into basically your data being currency to be you know, run through algorithms for many different purposes, almost all commercial. Um, and uh, that's what is so important about this project because there are, it was an enormous innovation that came out of GNI. The entire concept of transparency reporting is not written into those guidelines or principles. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think that was one of the most exciting things is people thought, okay, we got to do this, how to do it right. So to see it now that the companies understand the same way they thought the world would collapse if they agreed to half the things they agreed to at the time in GNI, if they now extend this to some of their own practices, um, that that may be a positive rather than a negative. So, I, you know, I think that um, the time is right, and I hope in the next iteration we can really talk about, about pushing. Yeah. And content curation is my next big issue that I yeah. want to get them into. Yeah. But. Well, I want to make sure we have time for questions. I'm sure there's plenty of thoughts out there in the audience. Uh, I don't know if we have mics. For, yes, we do have roaming mics, so any questions? Hi, it's Andrew Renz from the In-Debt Governance Lab at American University. So I, I need to ask sort of some factual questions to Rebecca to frame a particular question, which is, if I understand correctly, looking at MTN and Vodacom, you would have looked at their operations throughout Africa. Um, but Vodafone is based in the UK, and so it seems Vodafone's a relatively good actor, but MTN, in Africa, they're fairly evenly matched competitors, is not such a good actor. MTN's based in South Africa. So when you mentioned that the law affected how they acted, it's, it's the law of the home base that we're talking about here. Right, yeah, so just to clarify with our methodology for the telecommunications companies, we, we, we looked at two different levels, basically because we don't have many millions of dollars to hire people all over the world. We, what, what we ended up doing is we, we looked at the, for each telecommunications company, uh, we looked at the group level policies, so with the transparency reporting and the human rights commitments, the governance indicators are basically all at the group level, and then also uh, the, the transparency reporting uh, indicators are really looking at global transparency reporting. But otherwise, for the, for the you know, commercial privacy and security and, and, and you know, also sort of handling of government demands uh, around content and information flows. Those, the rest of those indicators, we looked at the home country operating company. Because a lot of these companies have, you know, in some cases, a couple dozen different operating companies in different markets. And because telecommunications companies are so physically localized, their policies differ in every single operating market, which is, have different from the internet platforms in that sense. So with MTN, we looked at their group level um, and their South Africa operating companies. And for Vodafone, we looked at you know, the, the global transparency reporting and governance commitments, but at, otherwise at their UK operating, uh, both fixed line and mobile. So, so that, that was just a, it's kind of a methodological necessity because there's just no way 
to properly kind of examine and compare and then average up uh, in, in, in any kind of meaningful manner kind of scores for every single operating company. And we, we actually looked at one point at, you know, is there some way of kind of doing spot checks for specific other markets? And just methodologically, it just didn't, didn't work uh, in a way that was going to make sense. Um, but that's why it's really important that I'd, I'd love to see, well, the Internet Sans Frontier, uh, which, is a, which is an NGO that operates largely in Africa, has recently done a report using our methodology looking at telcos in several African markets. Um, and, and so that's why it's important that people kind of take this and look more deeply at the operations of some of these companies in specific markets. Let me just add one thing to that. I mean, so Vodafone is among the, uh, the telcos who just joined G&I. Mm -hmm. And they are going to be assessed on their global operations. Mm -hmm. So in fact, if you ha and, and part of that assessment is looking at specific events that happened in difficult markets. So if you happen to know of any of those that you would like to share, no, quite seriously, because sometimes it's it's hard to dig them up. I mean, some of them are big, and you know, um, please please do. Um, that you know, this is the first time they're going to go through that kind of third party assessment, and that's always a part of it. Is is sort of picking some set of difficult cases and examining how they're handling it. Thank you. Sure. Hi, uh, Nina Gardner, adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins Science. Thank you very much to all of you for all the work you're doing, and Rebecca in particular, because this uh, ranking digital rights is extraordinary. Um, I wanted it, two questions. One to Rebecca specifically on, now that you've done all this huge amount of work, um, one of the things that came out very clearly in the hearings in the last couple of weeks is how poorly prepared our <laughs> congressmen and senators are on even understanding what these issues are. So question, one, of the, one part of my first question is, uh, are you planning to do a little bit of a preparation um, for all of these guys so th and women to understand what questions to ask uh, so that we can actually move forward here? Because uh, Zuckerberg was having a field day there. He got away with you know, answering nothing. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's a good question, and I, I'd love to hear kind of some of your thoughts about sort of legislative um, kind of preparedness. Um, I mean, I, I have spoken to some congressional staffers. That's not the same as, you know, as educating members, but, but that's a longer... It, we, we actually, new, just to give another advertisement to some other colleagues, there's a program called Tech Congress where they're actually placing technologists on the Hill working in, in representative members' offices. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's a, you know, very important. Among the very many, many things that need to happen. Um, but, you know, I, I think the level of education of this particular legislative body um, is, you know, if, if you think about all the parliaments around the world uh, and that are grappling with these issues and trying to figure out how to regulate, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, the Indian parliament, how, how they're doing on these issues or, you know, any number of these uh, other governments that are having, you know, major impact on the digital lives of millions of people as they're grappling to regulate this. I mean, part of the problem, I think, is that existing regulatory, legal, and judicial frameworks in much of the world are not fit for purpose in dealing with these issues. And especially that they're cross-border and you often have legislation passed in one country that you know, let, let's say, you know, legislation that's currently, you know, on the books in Germany um, around, you know, forcing platforms to take down content very quickly without any kind of judicial review. And it might make sense, maybe, it might make sense in a highly democratic country with great rule of law and great, you know, but even then it doesn't really make sense. But the implications of this for internet users around the world are very negative, but, the, you know, the, the people who pass the law, they don't answer to the rest of the world. They just answer to, to German citizens. And so we have a real problem um, with, with regulators in many jurisdictions. You know, I had a conversation with, with a member of the European Parliament not too long ago where I said, you've you got to consider what you're doing and how it's affecting people 
in the developing world and authoritarian regimes. And he basically said, I'm paraphrasing only slightly, he said, I don't care, that's not my job. Yeah. So, so this, you know, and, and so then we are, we're sort of counting on, and this is one reason why GNI exists, is that we're sort of hoping that companies will push back against kind of this, this mess. But then the companies, of course, have their own commercial interests, and, and kind of when, here we when are. They, when they come together with everybody else, else's interest, it's very powerful. When they don't, not so much. I mean, yeah. So I've been in this space, in this internet-y thing, since 1996. And um, in all that time, and in all the various places I've been, we would always, at a retreat, give an award private award to the two people who seemed to know something in Congress about what we were doing. <laughs> um, and um, I have to say, watching those hearings, I thought it was worse. I mean, over the years, particularly in the House where the members are younger, um, over the years, you built up a fairly, you know, a group who were at least educable, um, which obviously the senators weren't. Um, but, I mean, having also lobbied for a really long time, the truth is it is more, probably ultimately more important to have smart staff. And I don't know what happened to, to smart staff at that hearing. The Internet Education Fund, which was actually the spawn of CDT back in the day, um, continues to have never-ending events to educate on all these complicated issues. Um, you know, I'd say some people ought to get out of Congress because they're too old, but I'm going to be too old soon, so I don't want to kind of go there. Um, yeah. <laughs> You know, uh, but no, no, no joke. Two people. One was always Ron Wyden, so this is over 25 years. <laughs> we just keep substituting the second. I, I don't know what to say. I mean, we used to have, um, we used to have an Office of Technology Assessment. Um, we used to actually feel like it was important to ask somebody. They were probably, apparently, they were too serious. You couldn't get a quick response. Um, why Gingrich got rid of them in the 90s, I don't know. But we obviously need um, serious um, entities uh, to, to advise Congress. And um, you saw the same thing back in SOPA. They didn't have a clue what they were talking about. Not a clue. Stop Online Privacy Act. Yeah, the Stop Online Privacy Act. I mean, piracy. Piracy. Yes. Yeah. Well, and I think Freudian slip. <laughs> Any that of that. Secret acronym for that bill. I yeah. enjoyed the thinking um, part. I don't but I think one of the big questions too is just what level of technical understanding do we actually need legislators versus their staff versus regulators to have? And I think I worry there is a little bit of a, a tendency in the tech community in general to kind of you know, call out every legislator on every misstatement or misstep that they make in describing what are in fact some fairly complex technologies. Like, there's a lot of different issues where they have to have a little bit of knowledge on to be able to kind of do their jobs. And um, it's where I think something like RDR is so helpful. Because like if you can show graphics, right? If you can show, hey, here's Pictures. some, here's some, like this is a much easier entry point to actually having thoughtful conversations than a 20 page white paper. <laughs> um, to be able to say like, wait, why this shows me that, you know, Google is, at the top of the US companies and Apple is at the bottom, why is that, right? That, that gives you the opportunity to actually start having you know, an entry point into some real conversations that will get very technical, will get um, you know, into some real detail, but immediately contextualizes it in a way that helps people understand what is relevant to mm -hmm. them. Um, and I think that's for kind of for everybody in our space, framing it in, in that, from that kind of consequences for actual people um, as the, the entry point to let's talk about ultimately some really complex technical topics uh, is going to be a much easier way for, um, for legislators to engage. And can I just, I just want to say, because I, I sometimes have a foot in this space and sometimes have a foot in sort of this other broader space of either international affairs or looking at democracy and so on. And it, I think that sometimes in this space we get too caught up in thinking of the internet conversation or like this is a screen and keyboard thing. And Part of getting both lawmakers and the broader public aware of these issues is to make sure that people understand broadly it's not just a this is a screen issue. This is how you want to live your life. I think this is the consequences issue that you're getting at. Yeah. Um, and that goes beyond the companies in this index because increasingly it, these issues will be relevant to so many other companies. And, and this is essentially a way of staking out the parameters of the discussion that can then 
be expanded beyond these companies. Just as a brief example, you know, I noticed that Airbnb has now agreed to share information within China about people that use its service. Okay, that's not a tech company per se, but that is something that is incredibly relevant. And making things relevant in that way so people understand, okay, um, this is just one way of understanding it, but we need to expand our frameworks and bring the broader public in as well. I yeah, think. and the other thing too, just to build on what Shanti is saying, which is so important, is that it's increasingly going beyond what we, we traditionally consider the tech industry. Automobile companies, consumer appliances, you know, all of them are increasingly going to need to consider all of these questions in our index. You know, and not just privacy and security, but speech. A hacker a, a year or so ago posted a thing on Twitter, a picture of a refrigerator that had been hacked to, into a porn hub. You know, because it was like an internet connected refrigerator with a wide screen, open, wide open. and somebody was running a porn hub off of it. So now you have expression I issues in relation to, you know, home appliances. And I can bet you that General Electric and, you know, Electrolux have not thought about these issues at all if they're even thinking about this privacy and security stuff right. beyond right. what they have to do for GDPR. Mm -hmm. Yep. Can I just ask you a couple of, just the, how are you engaging with investors, for example, <laughs> to ask these kind of questions? Because yeah. these, you know, the pictographs are very useful for numbers mm -hmm. people who are not thinking about these issues. Yes. And there's nothing like investors asking those nice little yeah, questions. Yeah, well, I've, I've been, you know, talking to investors. In fact, I'm speaking at an investor event in London on Monday and um, kind of have a few other conversations going on. And I've just recently written something for an investor publication and, and, and Ranking Digital Rights actually put out an investor brief last fall, which is sort of like translating what we're doing into investor thinking. Uh, but the, the primary argument is investors, when you get beyond sort of the diehard socially responsible investors who have cared about human rights for a long time and, and recently you know, are, are part of GNI in terms of privacy, you know, in terms of surveillance and censorship and concerned about that, when you get beyond them, Investors in thinking about these issues have traditionally only considered the cybersecurity issues, so the, the, ha the data breach issues and the theft issues, right? So th those few indicators that we have in our privacy section, that's what kind of the traditional investor considers material to the business, to the value of the company. And the argue that I've been making uh, with the help of some of the people who advise the project who are investors, um, is that actually cyber risk is much broader than breach and theft. It's the, the damage to your brand and, and basically anything that can cause harm to users, both collectively and individually, is a risk to your business and therefore a risk to your investment, which means that everything in this index is materially, at least potentially material relevant to an investor, and investors need to be demanding that boards oversee risks across all of these things. So that's the argument that I'm trying to make, and I've got a bunch of presentations that I'm starting to, I'm gonna be starting to give beginning next week uh, to, in, to investors in a number of places. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll see, um, you know, Facebook's value seems to have it, you know, it's it's it's, it's yeah, it's, it's it's shares down 30 points, but its earnings are up. So you know, I mean, you know, it take, but it takes it takes a long time. How long did it take to get investors to care about pollution, or climate change, or even slave labor? You know, it has taken a long time, and there's some individuals in this room who've been working on this for decades. Um, and and you know, you don't get investors to get it overnight. And, and we're just starting on this one. And the light bulb is starting to turn on over more people's heads, which is a good thing. I'm starting to get calls and emails from people who were not calling and emailing a year ago. So, yeah. But I, I don't know if um, you know. anybody else has anything have, to say. Is there time for one last question? If there's anyone else out there. Too many, looks like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, 
Sharon Bradford Franklin with OTI here. Um, so there's been a fair amount of conversation about how just as you were um, putting this to print, um, there have been some new announcements by you know Google and Facebook, and we've obviously had an increase in pu the general public who doesn't focus on these issues like we all do on these issues. And Rebecca said that these uh, 22 companies do care. So I'm curious from not only Rebecca, but all of you, how optimistic are you that we will see great improvement before the next index comes out? I'll let you guys go first. I think I am optimistic if there's lots of attention to this, you know, to the, um, the, the content transparency, the content moderation and takedown transparency, that we will see some other companies move in that direction. I mean, there are a few companies that have as much content to take down as, as Google and Facebook, but uh, I, I feel like that's doable and that that's going to be a best practice five years from now, and uh, I feel really good about that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't feel really good about privacy, <laughs> no. which I think has, if you unpack it, is a lot more than privacy. Yeah, we call it privacy. And I, I mean, I would actually be optimistic about the fact that we are in this moment. So you mentioned the moment that led to the formation of uh, GNI, yeah, which was the Yahoo case, you mm -hmm. know, and that really galvanized attention. And we are in that moment again. And mm -hmm. after that moment, you saw real change. So this is a moment I think everybody in this community within civil society and broadly has to take advantage of it and push. Um, I'm optimistic. 17 of the 22 companies in the index between last year and this year made improvements. So I'm positive we'll see just as much improvement. But I would also caution what this index is. This index is the floor, not the ceiling. This, this index is the bare minimum of stuff that just, you know, this is like the easy stuff that they have no excuse not to be disclosing for the most part. You know, this, this is not the hard, the hard stuff is the business model stuff, which isn't in the index. So I, I think one thing to caution is even if everybody gets 100 on this, the problems are not going to be, there's many fundamental problems that will not be solved, but it's just like, at least they can do this, right? Yeah, and I, I just echo that I'm optimistic about more transparency on, on content moderation as the companies are, are doing it voluntarily, but probably pretty pessimistic about where um, government regulatory efforts around how they do content moderation will go. So we may be on a path where we see, you know, the companies really filling up those bar charts and, and, you know, and really increasing their scores on the sorts of things that they have leeway to do, um, while also, I fear, operating in, in environments where they are much, much more kind of constrained and restricted about how in favor of their users' human rights they really can be. Um, so with that, uh, I think that is all, all of our time for, for questions today. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Rebecca and team, thank you thank so you. much for all of Everyone. your work on this.